Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar from the Teacher Institute for Evolutionary Science. I'm so glad you Sorry about that. Don't know what that was. Um, today, we are going to meet the author of a wonderful new book that will be released in the United States on March 17th, 2020. The book is Darwin's Rival, Alfred Russell Wallace and the Search for Evolution. Um, I have placed the link to purchase the book on Amazon in the chat room. I've also placed a link to her other books and to Ties Education. Ties is a network of teachers. We are 70 presenters. We are science teachers who present evolution content and resources to other science teachers. Everything is free, so you can check out our website as well. Um, let me introduce you to our author today, Christiane Dorian. Dr. Christiane Dorian is passionate about the environment and feels fortunate to work with wonderful illustrators and designers to make the natural world spring to life through her books. Originally from Quebec, Canada, Christiane came to the UK to complete a PhD in education for sustainable development and has since made it her home. As well as writing children's books, she has worked as an education consultant for environmental organizations, including World Wildlife Fund, the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, and the Forum for the Future. Her work involves developing programs and resources to inspire children to explore the complex systems of the world we live in and to take positive actions towards a sustainable future. She's an optimist, as am I, and believes that young people can change the world and create a future in which both people and nature can thrive. I completely agree with that philosophy. So thank you for joining us today, Dr. Dorian. I'm just gonna ask people to please, if they have questions, you can post them in the chat. There's also ask a question down below. And after uh, Christian finishes, I will be asking her the questions that you guys have posted there. So at this point, I think I'm just gonna pass it over to uh, our wonderful presenter and author today, Christian. Thank you for joining us. Fantastic. So thank you so much, Berta, for inviting me to take part. Um, I'm so impressed by the organization, Ties, and humbled when I looked at all the brilliant seminars you've had so far. Um, Berta introduced me um, briefly. Um, I always have to apologize for my peculiar accent because of the mixture of French Canadian, but now I live in the UK, so it's a bit British as well. Um, but my background is in education and I'm a consultant in education for sustainable development, but also a children's writer. And I write books about the natural world. Um, my passion really is in sustainable development. It's in uh, encouraging young people to understand the complex world we live in, in order to protect it. I do feel that if we understand what's going on, we're more likely to want to protect our environment. Um, my passion, my inspiration, I suppose, come from the fact that I'm French Canadian and as a child, I was uh, brought up, you know, exploring the woods, collecting beetles and butterflies and um, going fishing and in the wilderness. And I think that has given me a love for the natural world. And I let a lot of people in my field have the same sort of emotional connection with the natural environment. I'll tell you a little bit about my book, my recent book, which is about uh, Alfred Russell Wallace. Um, and I'll, I'll uh, take you to, to um, a few pages because I work with an amazing illustrator, Harry Tennant, whose background is in um, printmaking. And um, so I will try to share, let's hope the technology works this time, but I will share my screen and um, I'll take you through the books and then we'll have uh, a few questions at the end. So uh, bear with me, I'm gonna share. Uh, can you see it? So here we are. This is my latest book, um, uh, Darwin's Rival. The title comes from a quote from Darwin himself, uh, which I will tell you a little bit about later. Um, but my first encounter with Wallace was when I went to the Natural History Museum uh, in London. Uh, I had the privilege of working um, in the archives where you can see all the original documents um, uh, original notebooks of Darwin and collections. And I was do doing a book about how the world began. So I was interested in evolution in Darwin. 
now in. And I came across someone there who was working there who was completely passionate about Alfred Russell Wallace and went to get this amazing collection of beetles. And if you look at them, these are more than 100 years old. And look at the amazing colors and shapes and variety. So I suppose when I saw this collection of beetles, my question was, why are they all so different? Uh, why do they have all these amazing colors? And how can we explain the difference in the variety? Uh, from one species to another, but also within species. And I suppose that's the same question that Wallace asked himself and Darwin. Um, so I decided to write about um, about the man because when I, 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 my background is not in science, I did a degree in geography, but I did in Quebec, we have this sort of two years between secondary school and university called Collegial, and I did pure science. So I did maths, physics, uh, chemistry, and biology. And I'm, let's be honest with you, I didn't understand anything. I passed, but I didn't understand and I didn't engage with science. And when I came across the story of Wallace, I thought this is a wonderful story to tell, to engage young people um, in science and also to, um, because as a man is so inspirational. So there he is. Uh, he was born in 1823 um, in uh, uh, an area of England that is now Wales. Um, and he's, he was an amazing uh, Victorian naturalist. Um, so he was he's a bit younger than Darwin. And he was not only um, curious and um, about the natural world around him, but he was also a very resilient character, very optimistic, uh, which I like about him, very funny and very resourceful. Um, so but uh, most of all he was very humble so i thought not only it's an interesting story to tell because of all the, the amazing discoveries he made um the most amazing is the theory of evolution by natural selection but he discovered many other species and many um other things i'll tell you about but also because as a man i find he's a good role model and at the moment i think we need these sort of inspirational role models um so he, as a child he was a uh, very interesting nature. His father was quite quite well off uh, and he lived in the countryside. He was born at the dawn of the Industrial Revolution. So it was a time of great discoveries and inventions and ideas of factories emerging in the UK, coal mines, um, the first steam engine, the use of iron in shipbuilding. So it was a time of great changes, but he was sheltered from all that and had this um, golden childhood, but he could just, you know, explore the woods and catch fish with his saucepan here. And he was the, the, the second youngest of nine children. So he had a lovely childhood. And then his father lost all his money. Uh, and then he had to go and find a job. So he moved to an urban area. And, uh, he had to find a job. So, so Wallace uh, was had this big change in his life, uh, went to school, and then he had to leave school at the age of 14 to earn a living. So what he started doing was to work with his brother, William, who was a surveyor. There were lots of surveyors in those days in England because of the expanding railway and they had to map the land for rich landowners and the railway. So that's what he did for a few years, but then his brother ran out of work. So he became a teacher. And it's very funny if you if you read his book, because most of my, 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 my book is based on the original uh, notebooks of Wallace and the books that he's written. And he talks about his experience as a teacher and he was very, very shy. So he didn't enjoy it very much, but he did. He, what he did in those days is that he went to the library a lot and he also started collecting plants and he became passionate. So he bought a, a book about plants and insects as well and he started collecting. And he also met someone who was very, in, very important in his life, Henry Walter Bates, who was another very famous uh, Victorian naturalist. And Bates introduced him to the delights and methods of collecting beetles. But you can see here with this quote, I put quotes throughout the book that illustrate uh, his his thinking process and how he came up with the um, the theory. And he says, I begin to feel rather dissatisfied with a mere local collection. Little is to be learned by it. I should like to take some one family of insects to study thoroughly, principally with a view to the theory of the origin of species. So it's really interesting that the, it was out there. The context was that most people uh, believed that the world had been created by God as it was, but there was a movement of people who were saying, no, there's an evolution of species, species change throughout times, but he didn't understand why. And that's what drove Wallace and Darwin as well to try to find an answer to that. So a few years later, Wallace and Bates, 
the two friends decided to do their own expedition. So they left England in 1848 and to go to Brazil to the Amazon rainforest. And again, what is really interesting about Wallace is that most uh, uh, naturalists of his time were from wealthy families or had good connections with the scientific world. Wallace was a humble man, he didn't have a lot of money, but he was very resourceful and he was told that if he could collect specimens that were valuable to museums across Europe and, and wealthy collectors, he could earn a living like that. So that's what he did. He went to Brazil, started collecting the rainforest, and he would collect two specimens of each animal, would send one to his agent in, in England, and he would keep the other one for his own research. And that's how he funded his expedition. Um, then the rain, yeah, the maze, amazing descriptions of the rainforest when he got there. So you can see him with his net and um, looking for the blue morpho butterfly. And you can see the quality of Harry's illustrations here. In the book, it's a really large illustration, but it's beautifully detailed. And so he was looking at the um, origin of species and he was um, collecting uh, many hours during the day trying to catch butterflies and he has amazing um, descriptions of what he found and observations. And when I do workshops with young people, I, I remind them that what is really amazing about uh, naturalists of this era is that they didn't have a camera or an iPhone or, or uh, an iPad to, to, to take pictures. So they had to draw what they saw. So that's why these, these, these of these illustrations are so detailed and that's how they could observe and, and study the different species. And he says, in all works on natural history, we constantly find details of the marvelous adaptations of animals to their food, their habits and the localities in which they are found. But, but naturalists are now beginning to look beyond this and to see that there must be some other principle regulating the infinitely varied forms of animal life. So when I read about all that, I was quite surprised how there was an emergence of an idea there, but people were trying to find um, the mechanisms. So Wallace and Bate um, uh, explored in the area of Belém, around Belém in the Amazon rainforest, but then he decided to go down the Amazon and his ultimate goal was to, di to discover the Rio Negro because not many Europeans had been there and he thought he would find amazing species that were unknown to science. Bates decided to stay there. Uh, we don't know if it's because they had an argument or they wanted to do different things, but he went his own way. And his brother, younger brother Herbert, joined him uh, to travel on the Amazon. And again, in the book, there's lovely descriptions of what they, they did, how they had to struggle to find canoes, to find local people, to help them, to find provisions, to, to, to um, get the support of local communities. Um, he was very meticulous in the way he recorded everything. So when he, he found a new insect or butterfly, he would indicate where it was found. And very soon he saw that the Amazon was like a barrier with different species of monkeys, birds and insects on either side. Um, and he says here, places that are more than 50 or 100 miles apart often have species of insect and birds at the one, which are not found at the other. And he's starting to think of this idea of some sort of boundary that determines the range of species. While he, uh, then he decided Herbert had enough by then. He was fed up with the life of an explorer. He was more of a poet than a scientist. So he went back to, uh, he, he made his way back to England. Sadly, uh, Wallace found out months later that his younger brother died of yellow fever. And again, it shows the hardship in those days for these explorers who didn't have any ways of communicating with anybody. And it would take months before they would get the news. So but the moment he started going down the Rio Negro, he was on his own. Um, and then he was uh, on the water for so long that he turned his interest to fish fishes and he started drawing all these beautiful fishes and he saw how they are really different um, in terms of shapes and size and he says of all kinds of fishes I found 205 species in the Rio Negro alone and these I'm sure are but a small portion of what exists there. Being a blackwater river most, most of its fishes are different from those found in the Amazon so he saw again the distribution of species. Um, there's also a lot of quotes in the book that shows how funny he was and humble and he's, he talks about how he was impressed by the local communities and their amazing ways of living in harmony with nature. He was an early environmentalist and at one point he says a hundred bright pairs of eyes were continually directed on, on me from all sides and I was doubtless the great subject of conversation. 
So he collected loads and loads in the Reunoi Grove, and he even drew a map. And this map is in the Royal Geographical Society in London. And what is fantastic about it is that it's 100% accurate. And he did that with four instruments. You can see many these main instruments. You can see the sextant there. You can see the compass, the watch, and he had a, an artificial horizon. And when I write my books, I, I make an effort to meet experts in different areas. And I met this amazing man, uh, Martin Hinchcliffe, who's a scientist, is a, is a, an expert in Victorian, Victorian scientific instruments. And he demonstrated to me how Wallace could have made this map because he was in the forest and he had a sextant, but he couldn't see the horizon. So he used this artificial horizon that had a, a pool of liquid and it is with the angle of the sun and the stars that he could measure his own position. And that's how he, he, he drew this map. And the other thing he did was to take his canoe from one point to another and calculate the speed. And that's how, so he could, he could um, draw the map. So it's absolutely fantastic. But then after a few years um, in the Amazon, he was feeling quite poorly. We think he had malaria. So he decided to go back to England, went down the Rio Negro, the Amazon, all the way back, and then had to find a ship to go back to England. But what it must have been aside because he had all his collections of specimens and he also had lots of live animals. Um, he, br he brought back to England monkeys and birds. Um, so, but then disaster struck. He took a, a ship and in the ship, there was some, some material that was badly stored, balsam that is very inflammatory and the ship caught fire. So Paul Wallace at this point had malaria, uh, was feeling poorly. Uh, he had to be rescued in these rescue boats that were leaky. And not only that, but he saw his whole collection um, in flame, everything that he had gathered um, to show the evidence of what he was starting to develop as a theory was but just went with the flames. Everything was gone, he said, and I had not one specimen to illustrate the unknown lands. I had trod or to call back to recollection of the wild scenes I had beheld. But being the optimist he is, that's where I find he's amazing. He had, um, he, he just had this endless sense of wonder for the natural world, admiring flying fish jumping above the waves and the dolphins with their beautiful metallic shades. And he says, um, what a, best, a better place to watch the shooting stars in the night sky than by observing them lying on my back in a small boat in the middle of the Atlantic. That shows the character he was. They were rescued days later by a cargo ship, a Russian cargo ship that was in a very precarious state. They nearly capsized. It was a terrible journey back to England. And by then he said, never again. But just a few days later, he was planning another expedition. So he gathered the fund, tried to publish a few articles of, of, on the um, things that he had collected in the Amazon, and then plan an amazing expedition to the, the Malay archipelago, uh, which is today Indonesia. He was 31 years old, so still very young, and he would travel for eight years in the archipelago, collecting 105,000 specimens of insects, birds, mammals, and reptiles. And again, he has wonderful descriptions that we've included in the book. If you look at the golden bird wing, he says, this is one of the most gorgeously colored butterflies in the world. The beauty and brilliancy of this insect are indescribable. Um, the standard wing bird of paradise, Wallace discovered many species of birds of paradise, and he has beautiful descriptions, um, a bright gem shining out amid the silent gloom of a dark and tangled forest. Uh, what he did when he arrived, and this is, the, I, I must say that this picture of Harry, Harry is I think absolutely beautiful. I was so fortunate that he gave it to me as a print and it's got a place of honor in my house. I think it's gorgeous. And Wallace describes this particular trip as the snuggiest trip on the boat he's ever had in his life. Um, what he did, he focused on beetles because there are so many different ones and they're easy to collect and look at the variety in size, shade and color. In only two months in Singapore, he collected 700 different species of beetles of all shapes and size. And um, here, you know, you can see with this picture all the different lovely beetles that he collected. So he started studying the differences within and between species. It was in Borneo that he made um, one of his first breakthrough 
in terms of a possible explanation. And he started to see a clear pattern in the distribution of animals and noticed that similar species were often clustered together in the same areas. And you can see here in the trees hidden, the, the orangutans, he's got beautiful descriptions of them in, in his book. And he said, every species has come into existence coincide coincident both in space and time with the pre-existing closely allied species. So that was one of his first breakthrough. So he meant that when a new species appeared, it must be closely related to another one, either living nearby or having evolved from a species that existed just before it. So he was quite excited about that and wrote a short paper. But as I said, he didn't have connections in the scientific world in England. He was a humble man, but he knew of someone. Uh, he, he told his agent, please, could you try to publish it in a scientific magazine um, to see if um, I can, you know, it can be discussed in the scientific world. There wasn't a very good response, but one man picked up on the article, a geologist called Charles Lyle. And he quickly told his close friend who was Charles Darwin. So Darwin was a bit surprised because he was working on exactly the same thing. And um, we feel we think that is that's what started the conversation between Darwin and Wallace. Darwin in those days was an older man. He was still studying his collections. He was looking for naturalists around the world to send him um, species uh, specimens so he could add you know, find evidence for his theory, and Wallace became one of them. So Wallace sent him a few specimens back in England. Then he travelled to Bali and Lombok, and there he made an amazing discovery, uh, which we call today the Wallace Line. He could see that all the birds that he had seen in Bali, the robin and the weaver and the barbet, were different from the ones, completely different from the ones that he found in Lombok. And the islands were so close together, he couldn't understand why. But then the sea between the two islands was very, very um, difficult. And people were telling that there was a very, very deep channel there. And he was wondering why could birds be so different on two islands that share the same landscape and the same climate. And the deep, narrow channel he found his conclusion was that it's like a boundary separating two animal worlds. So on the one side, you've got the birds typical of Asia and on the other of Australasia. And when he carried on traveling eastwards, he, he found out that it was the same for the mammals. So you've got the tigers and the tigers and the orangutans on the left, and you've got the kangaroos and the couscous and the cockatoos on the right. So that was a major discovery in terms of distribution of species. So he concluded, his conclusion was that sometime in the past, when the sea level was lower, so the islands with similar animal species must have been connected to each other. However, the deep channel between La Bali and Lombok meant that the two animal worlds on either side had evolved separately. So that was a major discovery. What happened next? So in the book, I go on about how the different islands he visited and the birds of par paradise he discovered. And But I will tell you just a bit more about how he came up with the theory. He, he had traveled in many, many islands um, in the hot, steamy jungle, often on his own. He was, um, he had malaria, so he often had fever. He often had infected wounds on his feet, so he couldn't carry on um, walking. So when he was housebound, um, he would take the time to study his notebooks and to look at his specimens. And in February 1858, this is where he had this moment of inspiration. Um, it was the answer to how species evolved and it had to be through natural selection. So from his own collection, he could see that individuals within a species can have slight variations like um, a sharper beak or brighter colors, but individuals with characteristics most suited to their environment are more likely to survive and breed than the others, and they would pass these useful, useful features onto their young, and the young would pass them on to their own offspring. But over many generations, changes in one species can occur gradually and result in the formation of entirely species. He saw that with the flying frog. He was the first European to observe the flying frog. And he said, probably the flying frog, flying frogs with webbed feet, um, larger webbed feet would have been able to glide in the forest more than the others. Therefore, it developed, in, it, he saw it as a transition towards a different species. He also saw the tiger beetles that he had studied um, in Bali and Borneo. Um, in Bali, 
it evolved to, to, you can see the dark beetle there, evolved to match the black volcanic sand of the island, whereas in Borneo, with the, the tiger beetle um, were, was matching the sand of, of the island. So he had lots of evidence to support that. But then his question was, now that he'd found that, what does he do with that? So what he did, he had the great idea of writing down his ideas and sending them to the person that he had contact with, Charles Darwin. Mm -hmm. Charles Darwin was, was completely shocked. He had worked on this for 20 years and he was a bit reluctant to publish his theory because um, because of the, the context where we there was a lot of resistance to this idea of evolution. His wife was very religious, so she was not encouraging him to do that. And he was taking his time. But having this letter from Wallace really pushed him to, 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 to uh, make it public. So he talked to his friends. Um, here we have the scientists, his friends Lyle and Joseph Hooker was the director of Kew Gardens and he explained his predicament, he said, he showed them the letter. So they came up with this idea of having Darwin's notes and Wallace's paper read together at the scientific meeting at the Linen Society in London. So this happened on the 1st of July 1858 and that way both men would be recognized as having discovered this amazing theory of evolution by natural selection and um so both both men would get the credit for it unfortunately wallace was still traveling in his islands hopping from one island to another looking for beetles didn't know what was happening and it's only later that he found out and a year later, Darwin published his book on the origin of species, and from then on he was seen as the main author of the theory, and he remains so today. Months later, Wallace received a letter from Darwin informing him of the meeting, and this is what I find amazing about the man, is that Darwin was asking him, I hope you can approve of this, and um, not only Wallace approved, but he was delighted. You, you can see his quote here, says, Mr. Darwin has given the world a new science and his name should, in my opinion, stand above that of every philosopher of ancient and or modern times. The force of admiration can no fur further go. And Darwin also um, wrote something very interesting. He said, very few things in my life have been more satisfactory to me that we have never felt any jealousy towards each other, but just being rival. So that's interesting that his reaction was positive. He says that in a way he didn't have um, the connections or the, he was not eloquent enough to articulate the theory and he was grateful to Darwin. So it shows a lot of humility here. Um, so what we included in the book in the way is the journey of both, both, uh, disco both explorers. You can see in red it's the journey of Darwin on the Beagle and he went around the world, collected lots of specimen, went back to the UK and studied his notebooks and um, came up with a theory and Wallace did it differently. He went to the Amazon, went to the Indonesia and was still out there when everything happened. Um, but this is a, a case of great minds thinking alike, as seen many times in the history of science. And I just want to end by showing you a quote that I've included in the book, because I do relate to that. I find often when you have challenges in life, it can give you the drive and explains how, how, where he got his drive from. And he says, had my father been a moderately rich man, who he was initially, but lost all his money, and had supplied me with a good wardrobe and ample, ample pocket money, had my brother obtained a partnership in some firm in a popular, uh, populous town or city, or had established himself in his profession, I might never have turned to nature as the solace and enjoyment of my solitary hours. My whole life would have been very differently shaped, and though I should no doubt have given some attentions to science, it seems very unlikely that I should have ever undertaken what at that time seemed rather a wild scheme, a journey to the almost unknown forest of the Amazon in order to observe nature and make a living by collecting it. So this is the story of a, a wonderful man, an amazing achievement, and a man who has been left in the shadow of Darwin, but I think more and more we are talking about him. But at the end of the day, what I find the most amazing about this man is his scientific curiosity and how he went about an idea that he had and found the evidence to support it and tell the whole world. So I can now, um, if you have any questions, I think I need to um, go back to the screen. I will try. Yeah. So um, 
I hope you enjoyed the book. And as I said, there are so many more beautiful illustrations in the book that I didn't include in the presentation. Oh, I can't Thank hear you. Thank you so much. The I think drawings are beautiful. Uh, can you hear me now? No? Oh, come on. It's Am delayed. I I can hear you. Oh, okay. Um, yes, it's a bit the, no. mo the most um, common comments were about how beautiful your drawings are. Uh, one of the questions was, which one of your books is your favorite? Or which one did you have the most fun making? That com comes from Natalie. This is a question I love. Sorry, this is a question I often get, and it's always difficult because in a way your favorite is the, the last one you work on. But I must say that, um, and all my books, like my first series of books, How the World Work, what was fantastic is that I was working with a, a paper engineer. So his job is to, to produce pop-ups and we could um, explain scientific concepts like um, the water cycle or uh, the different layers of the rainforest and the dynamics with the layers with, with pop-ups in three dimensions. That was amazing. But I must say that um, working on Darwin has been really inspirational for me because I, I can relate so much to not relate but I, I it was a real source of inspiration and I do do find that helps me to carry on when I did um for a while I thought I would stop writing books and having done this book I want to carry on because I just think it's absolutely inspiring so I must say this one but I, I I think that all the books I've done are different and working with different artists and different uh, different designers is so exciting I'm yeah. working on a new one that will, might become my favorite one oh, <laughs> that's another question is with what's your next book about that's another question you received so that's a perfect segue perfect yes my new book uh, is really exciting is about something called biomimicry i think oh. in the states we call it biomimetics biomimetics um and it's really um looking uh, but also in a fun way working with a wonderful uh, polish illustrator on how we can learn from nature to try to help us solve problems um, as I said, my main background is in sustainable development and I do uh, work with children and um, do lots of workshops and I do one workshop on biomimicry and it's just wonderful how it captures their imagination and yeah. children come up with inventions that are out there in universities studied by scientists. Um, so that's the new one I'm working on, on biomimicry and how animals are inspiring inventions, hopefully that will help us. Um, solve problems like climate change and sustainability issues. I have a, I met a scientist who works at the University of Iowa who's working on how geckos stick to walls. Oh, wow. With the gloves to, so, you know, you could climb a wall like Spider-Man. Oh, um, I would love to be in contact with, with, with the scientist because oh, I, he's great and he's had oh. he, he makes games on natural selection and stuff like that. He's a wonderful presenter. Actually, I should have him on for a webinar. I want to remind my, everybody my, that. My, because my ch what I really my goal I've got five golden rules when I write books for children for young people and one of them is inspire use of stories is a good one um, I won't tell you all of them but one of them is really to try to explain the science with accuracy and not being simplistic because I do find sometimes we tend to patronize children and I do I do ha love taking that challenge bioethics is a challenge because I think we have we can oversimplify but I would be fascinated because the page I'm working on is exactly the gecko and it's interesting oh. how yeah yeah read the gecko and how and the challenge is to explain that with with fun illustrations but trying to give enough information about the science behind it all and how we it's very it. complicated it's it has to do with van der Waal forces at the level of the molecules and things like that. Actually, they bond, they bond, the atoms bond with the wall. It's absolutely fascinating. Yes. And now, what fascinates me is that there are some people brilliant enough to be able to replicate that in materials that we use for different things. Well, I, I will send you a link of him sticking little geckos on glass and looking at them at the microscopic level and the molecular level and stuff like that. But let me ask the next question because you <coughs> kind of mentioned your other children's books. First of all, I'd like to remind everybody if they scroll to the top of the chat, uh, Dr. Dorian's page is there with all the other pop-up books and this book that we discussed today is there as well. But the other question is the age level. What is the age level of your books? 
you know, what target age do you have for children? Yes, my, my, I think the ones that are in the States are how the world work. I can show you. This is the book I'm doing, the sort of book I'm doing. Uh, this was the first book. It was, um, it's really, um, so that shows you a bit of the illustrations. It's, um, this one is for 7 to 12, so it's primary uh, age. But the one Darwin, we say seven plus, there's a, um, there's a lot of books in the UK now, non it's really exciting, I think, for teachers, is that there are non-fiction books, science books, for young people and adults. So I don't know if it's the same in the States, but there's a big um, explosion of beautiful, beautiful non-fiction books. So this one, Darwin's Rival, is seen as a book for seven plus. Okay, very good. Mm. Well, I think I've hit all the questions and um if i don't see any other questions coming i want to thank you for joining us on your sunday thank you for you it's uh like uh almost six in the evening is that correct yes but it was a pleasure and thank you so much for inviting me and i hope that i've inspired you to and the young people who are there i hope i've inspired you to engage with science because if i hadn't had books like that when i was young i would have become probably a scientist <laughs> oh, good. well i hope i hope the young people do become we need as many scientists as possible in this world of ours yes. and well, we're getting uh lots of thank yous in the chat box and i am going to go ahead and end this for today i'm going to delete out that little issue we had at the beginning with the microphone so that the recording will be nice and smooth fantastic if you so can send me those fun. links if you can send me those links that would be wonderful you know if you if there are anybody out there who would like to get in touch you know i would be delighted well you can why don't you go ahead and if, if you don't mind putting your email in the chat yeah and people I'll want to do that to, yeah and then people can get in touch with you i see there's a, some Ooh. college professors in the chat right now there's some young people there's some science teachers like high school and middle school science teachers so you have a broad range fantastic there we are there it is that's well, thank you so much thank you so much for inviting me i think it's a wonderful i wish um uh, you, i wish i can participate in, in many webinars so if you keep me informed of the com the upcoming events i will i would love to join very good and thank you everybody have a happy sunday and i'm ending the broadcast now good night thank you very much bye bye